Thank you very much, Sarah. And good evening to everybody. I understood from Sarah that I have to do two to three hours lecture, and then uh, um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, um, but but what I would like to, first of all, let me just say I'm, I'm extremely happy to be with you. Um, you know, of course, one of my questions was the title is Humanitarian Landscape. And I'll come back on that one because I like the notion of landscape. But looking at you uh, gathering just before, I realized uh, at least for you it doesn't work. You look really like a community, right? Very clear, very uh, knowing each other. Uh, uh, exactly. It's a pleasure. Cheers <laughs> uh, to, be, to be with you here. Um, what I would like to do is uh, I just would like to give you an ICRC perspective. I don't want so much to talk about the ICRC. I think you know it very well. The organization is more a perspective from the ICRC about the what we can call the humanitarian landscape and some of these issues or challenge um, and i would like to focus more on if you agree on i would say the inner dynamic of the humanitarian landscape we can talk about security about uh, the proliferation on non stem arm group but we know that right uh, so i would like to propose you nothing really breaking new but maybe one or two uh, thinking and 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 quite a lot of questions i think not many response i hope you will bring some response uh, on some of the questions we have and maybe just to start with the first thing is and sarah i was really pleased with the notion of humanitarian landscape if i may start with that and i think notions are sometimes extremely useful to explain what are we talking about and why landscape maybe be before be maybe because it's not the worst one uh, and at least it's much better than system one really could we just it's a plea get rid of the notion of humanitarian system human system gives this impression that it's well organized there are rules it gives and gives this notion that there is a center maybe you know when there is a system normally there are centers uh, normally there is one system in one coordination maybe, it means that people agree with that. I think it's totally misleading, at least now. And I think it doesn't correspond at all to the reality. At least, if let's put it that way, if we use system, let's put then an S, at least. There are systems, and I'm not sure about that. We can then of course use humanitarian sector, it's a bit dry, uh, you know, doesn't tell you anything about it, so let's drop it. Uh, we can, of course, use community, you mentioned community, but I must say, my sense is there is something warm in a community, and people knowing each other. Uh, maybe this is what, this should be our ambition. But I would carefully, uh, uh, or I would, I would be careful about using you mentioned community because it, it reflects a bit us here, knowing us very well, very much so. But community means that there are other which are not part of the community, maybe. Uh, maybe we should invite them to our table. So landscape in that sense is not fantastic, but it's maybe much more close to at least our own perspective at the ICSC of what we see today in the humanitarian landscape. Yes, landscape, why? Because we really perceive a diverse, absolutely diverse model, clearly, diverse actors, diverse agenda, clearly. And we also perceive that the landscape gives this impression that maybe we are going in a time where there is a tectonic shift. I don't know if it's a shift, but this major change in the way we connect to each other, even within our own families and system. And I would like also to, I'll, I'll mention not only the UN, but also Red Cross, Red Crescent family, for example, which have, as you said very nicely, have now 150 years. But it's possible that, uh, that's my bet, that the, le the next five years might be the most challenging years for this family, right? in terms of the way we coordinate our ch ourselves, the way we connect ourselves. So, good news, the title is a good title. Uh, the humanitarian landscape absolutely makes a lot of sense. So, in terms of challenges, I just would like to, we as I mentioned, we could really look into a lot of challenges. I just would like to take three of them. And then I will try to look at some of the opportunities that the changing humanitarian landscape is providing us. The first challenge is, and this is a challenge true for all of us, wherever we are, is the gap between the needs, the humanitarian needs, and our response. This is not new, but I think the sense is we are, we should, in fact, be able to close this gap. At least that should be our aim, right? And there is a clear sense that this gap is there to stay, possibly even to widen, if you look at at least some very important context. Syria is a good example. We are confronted today with enormous humanitarian needs, and our collective response, to start with the one of the ICRC together with the Syrian Arab, Arab Christian, Red Crescent, is absolutely far from responding to the needs. This is not new 
for years we were always confronted with that. But I think what is maybe new is people have a better sense of what are the needs. I think people affected themselves, they are much more clear, and you are much more aware of this gap. And I think there is something around that which is enormous. I think the second element linked with the gap, clearly for me, is the fact that we have more pressure, uh, more pressure on people affected. And if I look again the perspective of the ICNC, we just finished at the ICNC, we ask all our delegation, country office, if you want to really look at the issues, humanitarian issues, humanitarian needs, we ask to look at that to and then to plan for the year ahead. Looking at 2013, the image we have is a very uh, gloomy picture of the world. A very gloomy, and I'm sorry, of course, when you talk about ICSC, we cannot always be positive, that's for sure, you know that, that's the, the, the price to pay, uh, uh, not always at least. But let's be honest, in terms of needs, in terms of pressure on people, and we know about the protracted conflict, you know, all that kind of questions, but we also see so much these days, the economy crisis have an impact on the people. Put more pressure in middle class across the world, we see that. We know that the price of the food is very high. Uh, but we also know and we really see that, that of course, today governments everywhere in the world are absolutely affected by the crisis again. There is less money on social, there will be less money at least on humanitarian help and development. There is no doubt on that one. So it means in a way the gap is bigger. More pressure, the economic crisis really put a pressure on people, and we see that everywhere, not only in East Africa, but in all the continent. And at the same time, maybe, and maybe it's a question to you, slightly less ability for all of us to respond in the year to come. I can tell you just for the ICNC, we have a budget of a billion, a bit more, well, a billion euro. My bet, and I have some ICNC colleague in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in, in the room, so please, close your, uh, your, your ears for a while, my bet is that next year will be very difficult. Why? Because I can hear really that the crisis of the tax finance and all that is really hitting hard the government now. Even if they're trying to protect the humanitarian part of the budget of the development and, and humanitarian aid, I really feel it's more difficult. And that's not a surprise. So the pressure on us, and that's just the ICSC, will just, I think, increase. And of course, will lead us maybe to, to do the different things. So first element, first challenge for me, major one is really the gap uh, between, in fact, the people, their needs, and our uh, response. And it's the problem is, and to finish on that one, is it's not only a reality, it's also perceived so. Because on the symbolic, and there's always symbolic context, Syria is a good one, but you can look at Mali, you can look at Libya, you can look at uh, uh, Ivory Coast and Afghanistan. The perception is that these gaps are existing and we're not able in a way to cover them, or at least to help to cover them, right? And we can talk about resilience, coping mechanisms, the reality is there is a gap. Big challenge because it's a pressure on us. The second uh, um, uh, challenge I would like to, um, to mention is, and it's a very classical challenge, but I really do feel that it's a challenge is even more important today and tomorrow. It's direct access to people affected. And not access, really, just as we direct access. Close proximity to people affected. And here I have a major concern when we look about the humanitarian landscape. I have a sense, we have a sense, that direct as access is at lost. We're losing ground. And not just because of security, of course security is a problem. But also for two good reasons. One we know very well is the fact that today we're in a world where most of the government, even the weak one, the failed one, they know exactly how to control humanitarian aid, for good and bad reason. And sometimes, frankly, you can say for good reason. They have the responsibility to take care of their population, that's fine. We know also how they very smartly are able to use that control. And my worry is, within then the landscape, the thinker over the last five years, they have put so much at the center of the thinking, the host government, the host uh, humanitarian helper, whatever, that today it has become a buzz which frankly is, I think, making us real problems. And we can see that in most of the context. Let's talk about Kenya, for example. Kenya, the things that all the Kenyan authority will agree, even during the violence, is they will all agree that Kenya should, and it should be a Kenyan 
national organization leading the international aid help. They will agree about that, I can tell you for sure. We've seen Sri Lanka, we've, s we've seen Syria right now as an example, and we can go on and on and on. And I'm not saying it's bad, wrong. By the way, just let's remember, if I may, in this country, I'm very careful about what I'm saying, but in this country, if I remember well, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, when there was tensions, for example, in part of the country, I don't remember that, uh, in fact, any international help was welcome, right? Let's be very clear. So Europe knows so very well in terms of managing its own sovereignty. Uh, let, let's be also honest. But the reality is today host governments are able to control, they are able to put uh, a lot of pressure on our systems, right? Very, very strongly on, on that one. But that's not nothing new, it's just a reinforcement on that. And I must say, if I just look recently Syria, for example, if you look the pressure on Syria, the fact that politically everybody wanted to have a humanitarian response, and still today, still today, the UN response as such in Syria, just doing a humanitarian, is absolutely appalling. Not because the UN are bad at all, but because they have not been able to move out of from the box of host government, right? And they will have to wait until the Damascus Authority almost control only Damascus to be able to move then to another element. I mean, it, it's a very striking in a way in what it means. Host government, so that's one of the elements important. But I would say, if I, if I look about direct access, the other things which I think is very striking is the model. We should look also some of the models that we do have in the humanitarian landscape. And what are the models? Let's explore it. And I must say, I'm impressed by that, and I don't think we speak enough about it. Maybe we do research about it. What is the model of the last 20 years? Most of the, most, not all, but most of the big international NGOs, UN, other, what they have done, they have in fact outsourced most of the response, right? In fact, the direct response is not done anymore by actors themselves. Most of the time, not always. We have exceptions, MSF is an exception, right? But it's an exception today, right? I mean, you have a lot of major actors who are in fact have international partners, then national partners, and then local partners. And I'm not saying it's bad, it's an interesting model, but you need to reflect on that. What does that tell us? What does that mean? How do you work in an organization where over doing 10 years, yourself as an organization, you are less and less in direct contact with the people involved? What does that tell you? My sense is as an organization, it has an impact on, on the psyche of an organization. Really, we should think about that. Not just on the policies and the risk-taking, whatever. I tell you, if the ICIC as an organization, for example, would not be able to take risk, but also to be in close, linked, face-to-face -face with people affected, but also the one who are controlling these people, I think this organization will lose very quickly its edge. Okay, maybe we are not well equipped to be able to, to do outsourcing, that's another problem. And we are at risk, ICIC also. Because more and more we are working in partnership with National Red Cross and Red Crescent, for example, they are important. But for a long time they were side us, right? Now more and more they are the center of our own response. And I think it's something we cannot change, and it's interesting, but it will oblige us to think differently. It will oblige us to, on the contrary, to really make sure that we still have our people on the ground. That's absolutely clear. And I, I, I really, there is something about direct access that we should not, really not underestimate. And I think we're losing uh, as a landscape. Last but not least, of course, what is interesting is the new guys on the block that you mentioned. I'm not sure they're new, by the way. Uh, but it's interesting, if I just give you, my, it's not a surprise to my exam. I was in Mogadishu three, uh, four days ago. And uh, I mean, the only people I could met in Mogadishu outside of the airport, who invite me to a lunch and then to a dinner, was in fact not a surprise for you, was a representative of OIC, who is controlling, in fact, is, coordinate, is coordinating the human response of some NGOs from Saudi, uh, there were some Turk, uh, and it was what was the most in, even more interesting, he was in fact the former head of the hack of Sudan, and it was fantastic, you know, we had very tough relationship in Khartoum, but then sitting in Mogadishu, we really enjoyed it. It was, it was a, an interesting moment. But um, in a way, um, uh, it's interesting to look at. They are there. And with all their problems, frankly, in terms of prints, we can discuss them later on. But the fact that they are more and more there, right, will give them an advantage, and uh, I'm, I'm sure an advantage over time on, on the humanitarian landscape, the parts we know, right? I think very clearly. So the presence 
it, I know it's a big issue in terms of taking risk, what it means, how do we play that, but I think outsourcing risk, outsourcing connections, outsourcing counting on the other to do that is extremely risky. And here, why is it risky? If it's only one organization that does that, that's fine. But the key organization, the very same who are doing that, they never speak about that, even th within their own organization. And they never bring that at the table when we have discussion. And that's the problem. So we almost forget that we have this model. And this is a, this is a majority model, not a minority model. So that's the second gap, direct access, close proximity to people affected and to the place where it happened. I think that's not a, a big surprise, but, but th that's in something important. My third and last challenge is, and maybe it's a question to you, in fact, and I'm not sure I get it right. And again, I'm looking at the lands humanitarian landscape. It's a combination of two elements. One, competition. That's not a surprise. We have competition. That's okay. But competition combined with deregulation, that starts to be complicated. And this is exactly what we're going through. I think it's a time where we go through deregulation. Right? We can always, I'm putting a word on, we can discuss about the, about the tag. But what I'm saying by deregulation is, very clearly today, our coordination model are considered by the vast majority of actors who should be coordinated as, at minimum, a pain, at best, you know, something that is imposed, but, you know, that, that's it. But they, cons they are obsolete. They don't produce the result. And more importantly, if you go across, if you are able to, you know, not being coordinated, you have no punishment. You know, that's okay. You can, you can go for it. So the investment that you put in coordinating yourself, trying to coordinate, versus the impact, your ability to operate, is starting to be a real issue. And I'm not talking about money here. I'm talking about the ability to, again, close the gap. And here we have problems. And I'm not just looking at the UN cluster system. I'm also absolutely challenging, for example, the Red Cross, Red Crescent coordination system. We do have a rather light, at least on paper, system, which very clearly normally distinguish what the ICSC and for the one who are aware, what the Federation of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and then what the National Red Cross should be doing period of crisis, period of you know conflict, per natural disaster, and it's on paper. It's pretty smart, by the way. At the time, people who did that in '95, good job. The reality is today, it's not respected anymore. It's not respected at all. It's context-based. Is everywhere we go, of course, competition, right? And that's not a surprise, right? And the deregulation, you know, bring absolutely National Red Cross and Red Crescent and ourselves also to find, the, you know, to uh, have to find. You can, you can say, you know, this is what we call agreements of Sevilla, but that doesn't fly anymore. That doesn't work. Right? So our models of coordination are obsolete. And I think they don't produce any more result. And my problem is a lot of donors' country who are there to support that. When you tell them, they said there is no yeah, end. Do you propose something else? There is nothing else. Though. So let's try harder. We know it doesn't work. No problem. Let's try harder. We can try harder. But I can tell you, in terms of impact on the ground of what it will happen, the gap between, again, the needs, <laughs> our ability to deliver through coordination will be a problem. And my point is we need more coordination. That's the problem. It's not less. We need more coordination. But the model doesn't work, and in fact, the deregulation will just push us, to, I think, um, to, to, to be move, move around. And of course, competition, I mentioned before about the funding, will just, in fact, create more, more pressure uh, 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 looking into that. Last but not least, when we talk about deregulation, of course, it has also an impact on what I would call our principled approach. I think here in this room, if we do a survey, let me just guess, 96% would just totally, I'm sure, support a principled approach. I hope 4% not, <laughs> to, to have a better challenge. I'm just looking who cannot support the principal approach. Uh, but you support it, right? But we should also look at what deregulation is telling us and what competition is meaning today. Right? And I think it's a time also where we have to wake up a little bit in terms of we are also talking about the principal approach. Right? We think this makes us different from the rest of the pack, especially the new guys on the block. But do you think the people you know, affecting, looking at us, they will really make a difference, especially if we're not present anymore. So if you don't follow the principle, but you're still there, and we follow the principle, but we are in the bunker, I mean, <laughs> I mean, in terms of, 
I mean, good for us to measure, but I mean, just for the people affected, I think I really see some issues. I'm not saying we should depart from principle. I'll come back on that one. But we should be careful, again, us looking at us as human landscape, thinking as principle, as long as your principle, it's good, you're okay. I will challenge that. I will more and more challenge that. Right? I will challenge that, especially for people affected. And last but not least, in the deregulation and in the, uh, in the coordination, I think the jury is less and less us. The jury is more and more the people affected. Right? This is not new. We talk a lot about accountability to beneficiaries. But I think what is interesting to look at is today people are well informed. They communicate. They rate us. I think what is happening to computer, to Apple and to other, I mean, we should look at people are used to rate. Right? They rate everything. You know, this seems to be the base. Even you, the UK government rate us, right? Uh, remarkable, by the way. I uh, was very happy about this rating. But the, reali the, the reality is, I think there was the government and with you know, the system looking at us, looking at our own system, and very interesting. But tomorrow, I really am I'm of the opinion that people will rate us. No problem, they're used to that. Uh, you're doing good response? No, yes, three star. Two. Okay, maybe we'll have to look at what it means. I don't know if it will be star, but I think it will. I'm, I'm just serious about it. I'm still not sure how to capture that. I know that in each of your organization, you've already some story about how much your own planning has been influenced by people being able to talk directly to your boss or to the media or whatever. It's happened to my organization on very interesting things. I mean, one of the most interesting examples is a Syrian example where, in fact, when we visited the first prison in Syria, and as you know, we've been able to visit only two prisons, and since then we're still trying, and we've not been able to do it more than that. But the first prison, when we visited, some of us got the very same day when we announced we will visit Damascus Central Prison. We got SMS from Syria, people saying, it's the wrong prison. <laughs> hey, guys, wake up. Ooh, it's the wrong one, you know. I mean, what do you do with that? Okay, I can say cancel, delayed, uh, trying to, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, and they were still not rating, but I mean, this is the way it, it works. Look at something else, totally different, but interestingly, l l in terms of rating, it happens recently to uh, our colleagues from the American Red Cross during Sandy. They had too much, I think they did a great job. They tried to do their best, you know, and it was a bit painful. Here we are outside of conflict, but still, you know, and then there was a YouTube, a guy, you know, very famous, yeah, I don't know the guy, he was calling, you know, he was somewhere with Flood and said, where is the Red Cross? They're not here, they don't help me. I mean, they had 200,000 view, everybody was saying that. So I really had to counter this customer, you know, not happy, rating the Red Cross live. Uh, and they really had to work this around, you know. It's not a surprise, I, we should not exaggerate that, but Let's think about that for a minute because I think it will more and more affect us. And of course, what I'm saying is then all the work we do about coordination, about all that, will not be measured about coordination or about principle. It will be, are you there? Are you helping us? Here. Big issue. So that's my three challenge. I'm sure there was other, but okay. So, but still, there are some, don't, let's not panic. <laughs> uh, there are some way to, um, I think, there are at least some opportunities in, in the humanitarian landscape, or at least the changing humanitarian landscape. I, I do think so. The first one, and I must admit for us, for my own organization, and maybe for myself, it's a bit difficult to accept that, but I think, I think it's the idea is we need to, to accept, not only to accept, but to capitalize on the fact that this landscape is, on the other hand, a joy in the world of today. It's maybe the most diverse group of organization working in one, I don't know, let's, I'm using sector for one, in one sector. You don't have that. Any other sectors is suddenly not as diverse than the humanitarian landscape. <laughs> Completely diverse. Different take, different organization, different way. And maybe this divers diversity is something positive. And maybe, I know some of you have worked on that. I think we should also agree that we were all hoping that if we would do good, we would do the same, you know? And most likely we will even almost look the same, right? No, this time is over, right? So most likely in the humanitarian landscape, or for the next 10 years, we'll have to live with a very fragmented, different perspective, different take. But if we say we capitalize on the diversity, then we have to think two or three things differently. First, we have to think our coordination model differently. We have to. And if we don't propose, other will propose for us. Or there won't be any. And that will be very difficult. And I'm not sure I got the right response, and I think we need to try. Really, here we need to try. 
I think the first things we need to agree if we talk about the coordination system, it seems to me at least, is we need to have a minimum, I which, is, which uh, strikes me these days, is we don't have a common language, including in the Red Cross Red Crescent. We should have, it seems to me, a common narrative, at least when the crisis starts, on what are the needs. It seems basic, but it should it would be very helpful not to spend so much time on our intentions and what we can do and our planning, but just to agree what are we talking. Today we know very well that figures of needs are constantly used to position ourselves, push it for political reasons sometimes, getting funds, it looks basic, but I think that's the minimum we should be able to do, have a minimum of common language. I think that will help a lot, right? One, I would say at least we can, we can do that. B, for me, uh, we should also agree that the coordination models, maybe, should not be central. In a humanitarian landscape, there is no center. That's maybe the point we should agree with that. And that's panicking. Of course, I'm coming from Geneva. My vision is I'm at the center. Uh, maybe I'm not at the right center. Maybe there is no center anymore. Maybe the center's with us. So the idea, I'm meeting next week in Roma with Valérie, you know, with Etherin, with Antonio. We'll have a great time. We'll discuss that. No, we'll discuss, I'm, I'm serious about it, and we'll do, do discuss serious things. But we think, in a way, that sitting together, this is maybe what is the closest to the centers of the humanitarian, then we will call it system. My sense is, I mean, this is not where it's happening. We know that. It's absolutely timed and coordination, if we're serious about that, coordination should, should be contextualized. And not only being at level, contextualized. It's possible that the deal you do, and that's the problem, should be different from a country to another. And it's very worrying because in terms of transaction costs, it might be much more complicated. But maybe that's the way we have to go. That's the way. And put few things on the ground. Yes, transaction costs to be bigger, but we need we will then maybe come back to again after after the period of deregulation, maybe to back back to some rules. That's possible, but let's agree on that one. And here, two rules: one, we should coordinate action, plan, and not intention. Sounds basic, but you know, really, right? it's very simple. It will help. So intention, thank you. No, really, that could be used at the center, on the ground, where it's contextualized, much more close to action to what we try to do, what we try, okay, and plan. So that sounds, uh, it seems to me at least that's something we can do. And B, I'm still of the opinion that we should then coordinate ourselves depending on the situation and depending on the actors you want to coordinate with. So you don't have to coordinate with everybody, right? So for ICSC, if I look in most of the context, I'm honest, it depends on the, on the situation. Of course, we need to coordinate with the Red Cross, Red Crescent. No choice. They are very important. They are key more and more in our context. They are the center, not always, but they put a center of response. And in terms of identity, we have a co-identity. So that's very clear. But today, if I will look around the world, I would say the actors I will coordinate with, number one, remember in the 80s, number one, MSF. For me, ICSC. Before any other act. Because they're closest. We are more and more together sometimes, place. so we need to coordinate ourselves. And not only coordination in terms of you know, just sharing the places, but also trying to push issues, trying to see how it works. And of course, MSF is very different than we all remember. Uh, it's a bit, a bit taboo and almost incestuous to imagine that ICSC will coordinate really with MSF. Because yes, I mean, that, that maybe, maybe there is something to look at. If I'm serious about contextualized, that's it. And then depending on the context, depending on a situation, of course, there are some contexts where you will have to coordinate, for example, WFP, no doubt on that one. WFP, why? In Syria, for example, because WFP use, and rightly so, by the way, absolutely transparently, but they are absolutely central in their ability to uh, impact uh, our own national Red Cross or Red Crescent. In fact, as we know, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent is at the center of the response. So we need to agree how do we work around that, helping to have the Syrian Red Crescent having a minimum of capacities to respond. So important to look at WFP. WFP also, then, because WFP is now moving much more to cash in terms of uh, assistance, it will impact all of us. So we, ne we need to agree how, how to work around. So a much more contextual approach, finding ways, and I know it's a difficult element, right? And, and that's something we need to do. Which means that it's true in terms of dynamic, uh, we might have some surprise, I have no doubt on that one, uh, but we have to do it. Again, Syria, the big work I was doing on Monday was to discuss with the Turkish Red Crescent 
and the Qatari Red Crescent. They have a totally different perspective, I can tell you. <laughs> Even I'm just sorry to talk about my own little groups, but no way. I need, they need me also, but I need them too. We need to agree on that one. That's the only one. If I come to lecture them on how they should do it, whatever, no way. Right? Now, on the other hand, and this is maybe my third point, when you partnership, there are some value that we need to maintain. I will not partner with everybody. I will not. As an organization, we need to agree about two or three things. And here, I would like to come back to principle. It's time, for some of us at least, to move outside of the mantra. Great to have the principle, but I do think that the humanitarian principle, the way they're used by us, has become a mantra, like a yoga. A yogi, you say? Okay, very good. You know, kind of, mm, which is very positive for us, gives us this sense that we're going in the right direction constantly, but I think it's time that we rediscuss what we are talking about. And here, I will be very clear, we should partner only with an organization which agree, and that's the basic, to be impartial. Seems absolutely basic, but agree to put impartiality central. And impartiality, contrary to other, humanity is much more complex to manage, but impartiality you can discuss, you can measure, you can unpack, you can really look into that. And why impartiality? Because impartiality is really at the core of what I would say will distinguish tomorrow humanitarian actors of the actors doing relief. And I think we should in a way, start to move and have a line here. If there is a line, that's maybe where the line is. And I do think you impartiality is really the, the, the principle to allow you to really, at least it's a more, more than a commitment, it's very, very strong. It means that to put the needs of the people at the center of your response. Which, by the way, to do that seriously, more and more, you have to be close to the people, most likely. Maybe you have to change your tactics, you have to do face-to-face. -face. So it's a type of humanitarian, which I do think is interesting. As an organization, ICSE, we want to maintain, to continue absolutely to demonstrate our neutrality, our independence and impartiality. We're convinced about that, and humanity. But we don't want to impose that to anybody, and just why. I think the discussions I would have with some of my colleagues from Red Cross, Red Crescent, as an example, or other partners, would be much more interesting if I'm serious about impartiality, what it means, how do we develop that? Instead of just talking about all the principle, yes, you are principle, but then we are never serious about it. The discussions we have at the interagency uh, standing committee or at the SCHR are much more interesting when you start to dig in to be serious about one principle and really look at what it means instead of having the big discussions on, on principles at all. So I think it's time, back to coordination, more contextualized, less at the center, agree that the deal might be different, and the transaction cost, I know, will be bigger, it's possible. Meaning also that then we are specific on some issues, like principle, but then we really change the dynamic, and we are serious about it, and we're talking about the coordination of action, act, plan, and not just intention. And I think that would already I think, uh, help us uh, a lot. Last but not least, um, I can see the time is, is moving. Um, if, if I would just maybe say two more things in terms of opportunities. One is, I think we need to invest more into our own people. We know that, we've talked about that. But in the humanitarian landscape, I'm still amazed, if we are serious about that, how little, not all of you, but all of us, but how little we are investing in the way we are managing, supporting, developing, retaining our people. We could do better. At least I can do better. Uh, and we should be able to do better on that one. In terms of developing leadership, absolutely. If we agree that we want people more savvy, we want them to be able tomorrow, tomorrow the humanitarian leaders and with the humanitarian teams, if we want them to be closer to where it's happening, they will have to do more deal it will be more complex. The world won't be simpler, right? They will have to work around that. They will be able have to be able to monitor still what's happening. They will have to pass deal to understand what the partners are talking. They will have to carve different type of operation and not just apply what they have learned systematically from a context to another. If we want to do that, no way, we will have to manage our people differently. And last but not least, we will have to manage our international staff but also our national staff differently. 
Absolutely. And find the right mix. I'm not of the opinion that the national staff will resolve all the problems, but I'm of the very strong opinion that the right mixity, the right diversity again, would make it much more interesting. So investing in people is seems not something rocket science, but absolutely possible. And with the changing United landscape, this is maybe the best way where we will build something together. Because in fact, when you operate together, this is where you construct relationship. But when you train together also, when you develop together, this is also where you, you create some very strong element. So we need to develop maybe a Red Cross carrier, maybe humanitarian carrier, not here in terms, in terms of training uniquely, but also to bringing things together, being able to, to look into that. And in that sense, Sarah, what you do in ODI, uh, the way you're looking at things and the way you are bringing that back into the humanitarian landscape is, I hope, something very important. Thank you very much.